Hello there everyone, and welcome back to TNO, The Last Days of Europe. I'm your host, Mr. Mokulover, and we must read about tales from the past. And now for a word from our sponsors. Citizens of Eurasia, have you ever found yourself wondering about the exploits of your ancestors? Are you interested in becoming enlightened and inspired by the mighty Eurasian civilization's past glories? If so, then we have great news indeed. Coming soon to State TV is an exciting historical documentary series that is sure to have you on the edge of your seat. For the creators of the critically acclaimed documentary, The Chimera Among Us, <laughs> comes exhilarating historical epic, Eurasia, Passion and Power, right alongside the fear to tell the Hun, as he puts the fear of God into the decadent Roman Empire. Follow the meteoric rise of Genghis Khan, from tribesmen to master the known world. March with Alexander Nevsky, as he fights to save the Rus from the savage Germanic hordes. All these tales and many more coming to a TV set near you, complete with narration from our guider himself. This is a nightly historical entertainment sensation that any patriotic year Asian surely won't want to miss. The adventure begins tonight at 8. I've got to see that. Absolutely. And we've unfilled import requests. Oh boy, Japan, you can't give us our goods? Oh, Japan, why? Why? Uh, let's see, where are we at? Ooh. And... Oh, well. So be it. Awesome. So now we need a little bit more rubber, apparently. Indonesia, thank you very much. But a couple comments. Uh, someone said... Islam is a religion, not a race. It's just what the devs are doing. Yeah, I know. And also that... Will I go full Eurasia in this campaign or just do full Russia? Well, we could probably only do full Russia realistically. But, uh, I'll probably use Consequence and get all of Asia under us. Just because we can. Or we will be able to just because we have Consequence available. So, we'll probably do that. But, it is almost 1969. In which we... Well, we can do Russian reunification, I guess. Or prepare for war. No, let's prepare for war. We definitely want to prepare for war, because that'll be good. We don't do that one yet, because that'll get rid of our focus tree. So we can do all this stuff. We need to get some land forts, land forts, get some bonuses, get some air bases, get some infrastructure. A grand showdown. Let's see who will stand tall in the end. And we just purged the Atlantis' weakness. Very good. Because I want to get through all this stuff first. So we did this one. We just finished that one up. Let's do maximal or operational range. It seems that the main barrier to Germany's terror bombing was the sheer amount of landmass they had to cover. Even launching from air bases in Moscow and the Caucasus, they rarely had the range to reach all their intended targets. We can probably thank that fact for their relative ineffectiveness. However, we might fight the same problem someday again. We are far behind the Germans in terms of aviation technology. Our ancestors, or not ancestors, our aeronautics engineers will need to play catch up, but most of them simply pursue identical technology to our enemies. They must design aircraft and engines to maximize fuel efficiency and storage. This will allow for the maximum possible operational range and necessity for the conquest of Eurasia. Additionally, we'll probably do strike the steps. There's nowhere to hide on the steps of Eurasia. That, combined with its sheer size, is likely the reason that the steppe peoples adopted nomadism in the first place. Nowadays, settlements on the steppes are common, but we can also use the steppe size as part of a military doctrine. In the vast open spaces, columns of infantry and vehicles are highly vulnerable. They may not face a serious threat from nomadic horsemen anymore, but with aircraft, are a different matter. Without the cover of mountains, forests, and cities, our enemies will be easy pickings for specialized cast aircraft. Very cool. And since we still want to stay as, as this at this stage for now, just because we can further improve society and get some bonuses to industry and GDP and agriculture, and we can, yeah, this stuff is okay. But awesome them. The colonel eyed his audience carefully. They are all young enough to be his sons and clearly haven't seen combat. Perfect. The young and inexperienced were always more malleable than most. The captain cleared his throat, ready to give the recruits the pep talk of a lifetime. Brave sons of Eurasia, I understand that you've come here today wanting to know what we're up against. Yes, sir. Good, because I'll tell you what you'll be facing. Our civilization's ancient enemy. You see, when this country is united, a great test of wills awaits Eurasia. The rust and Germano-Germanic civilization has encroached upon her people's sacred lands in the West and have claimed it as her own. Even now, they attempt to remove any trace of Eurasia's culture, and that still remains. This cannot be allowed to stand. The colonel flicked on the projector screen behind him, revealing a detailed map of Reich's Commissariat the Muscovine. And as you can see, this is not just a struggle for reclamation. It is a struggle for the survival of our ethnos. Weak Atlanticist concepts such as mercy cannot be shown when the Teuton threatens the very existence of Eurasia. He noticed some of the recruits in front of him becoming visibly nervous. They will understand in time, he thought. As the great Genghis Khan did before us, we too shall make the entire world cower in fear as the unbridled fury of the Eurasian people is unleashed upon them. Their soldiers will be slaughtered, their lands and people defiled beyond recovery indeed. Our foes have forgotten what a true war is like. We shall remind them. They are not prepared for us. Very good. Actually, let's take a look at our societal laws. So we're at what? Two, 7.25. We'll get this one done next month, which is awesome. Agriculture is not too bad. We're mass mechanization. Poverty is still not too bad. 
industrial equipment is not too bad. Factory complexes, experience, industrial base, nice. And Ben has been reelected again. Nine. Ooh, we're going to hopefully get rid of widespread cronyism very, very soon. And do political interference. And we're spending a crud ton on money, on debt. Spend 20 billion. My goodness, that's so much. Oh, additional reserves. Yes, well, free manpower. If you like to read about better research facilities, please go right ahead. We'll get back to school someday. Yes, we will. And strike the steps. And which next, we will go ahead and do... Ah, let's do mutual acknowledgement. They might be despicable Atlanticists, and the manifestation of all that is corrupt and vile in the West, but perhaps they're not without some use. After all, only the U.S. and their puppets still oppose the fascist power blocks at a global level. Proper diplomacy is out of the question at this time, but there's no harm in establishing some tentative talks, or links. If they acknowledge our legitimacy as the established government of West Russia, we shall do the same for them. That's not much to ask, is it? Of course not. There's not much to ask. And cool, we'll get some more manpower soon, too. Which would be awesome, awesome, awesome. Now these guys are going to kill each other. Which is fine with us. Oh, we can do some more stuff down here. Yes, please. This will be the last time we can actually do this stuff. But, better equipment. Uh, construction speed, yes, please. Equipment, yes. Poverty, oh, yes, 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 yes. And we still have over 500 political power, which is insane. Just do that, then. Yeah, do both. Who cares? We have enough PP. We'll have to core a lot of stuff later on, but that's alright. And we're still building up a lot of cities. Because I love, love, love cities. And there's Scotland. It's cool. And we get the unification. And which I'm not going to be bothered with that. We're just going to keep going on. Um, there's going to be sound effects, but whatever. Against Romano Germanics. Uh, when I open Islamo Turkish Overtures, I could probably do that one. Islam has much in common with the Russian cultural eth ethos, like us. Muslims have tr value tradition, hierarchy, and unity. And they've been unfairly treated by Russians in the past, an unfortunate outcome of our own ethnosis tendency towards religious fanaticism. It's past time that we begin trying to make amends with our Islamic brothers. We have just as much reason to hate the Germans as we do. They do. Being fellow victims of the terror bombings. Our family is more than mature enough to, to disagree on the topic of religion without argument, surely. Right? Right? Let's grab some resource efficiency gain, too. Yeah, that's really bad. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> so much debt. Hope we can get cut this debt sometime. Especially when we make so many civvies. But, oh! Oh, it's just... Oh, okay. Against the Romano Germanics. It appears that a rise of power is yet to be noticed by the Europeans, given the total lack of recognition we deserve. Perhaps the reminders do. It's been quite some time since the degenerate Romano Germanic civilization was put in its place. The guide of the Passionaris Revolution himself has elected to carry out this task. As the embodiment of all that is great in the Superethnos, this was naturally the right decision. Let's see how well the hubris of our foes received this particular strike. The U.S. replied We've received a reply to our diplomatic invitation to the USA, expressing their reluctance. <clears throat> To be seen favoring one Russian faction over the other, they have unfortunately rejected our suggestion to establish limited ties and formal lines of communication. They won't ignore us for long. Wow, that sucks. But we'll get to them eventually. If you'd like to read about ar better armor professionalism, please go right ahead. Excellent. More attack, defense, planning. Awesome, awesome, awesome. Since we're here, um, I guess we can start doing some uh, intel stuff. It does hurt down on our civvies, but that's all right. Yes, please. And cross your olds. Well, we kind of already crossed the Urals earlier, but that's all right. Oh, yes, please. One, two, three, four-ish. Four and a half-ish. That's not great. Oh, boy, that's not good. Then again, we do have 32 divisions. And I'm not going to change that so much. That doesn't really matter right now, but it'd be nice to get rid of that. But when I open, there will be blood, that is certain. Not between the peoples of Eurasia, but between ourselves and the other super ethnosis of the world. The Romano-Germanic Asiatic Alliance had its clash with the Atlanticists and proved itself the stronger, but that alliance has collapsed in the latter resurgent. The world stands on a nice edge, and Eurasia must be the last nation standing when the time comes for bloodshed. No matter what happens, we can never trust the other super ethnosis. Like us, they look out for themselves first and foremost, of course. We are the noblest and mightiest of them all, but according a rack and so bite. We will never be their friends, nor, nor, but nor are we so foolish as to underestimate them, as they do all each other. That's good. Cool. Get more PP2. Eurasian Aerial Hegemony. The second purpose of the Eurasian Air Force will be to maintain the hegemony of our state. It has not escaped our guide's notice that our brother, Ethnoses, can be a little too rebellious for our taste. He doubts war with them will come, but there's no harm in preparation. The Germans failed to bomb us into submission, but they succeeded against the British. The Luftwaffe proved that any nation can be bombed to the point of surrender or compliance, provided one is enough ordinance. Perhaps, but not hopefully. We will have to teach our own brothers that lesson as well. And better oh, blueprints, nice. I like that. <clears throat> and the frozen shores? Probably frozen shores. What can you do over here? Anything? Crossing your own Oh, national service programs? What's this? Oh, yeah, better consumer goods. Oh, yeah, do that. definitely do that. One, two, three, four, five. Oh, yeah. 
We'll keep pause on the intelligence agency for now, but frozen shores. Eurasians are generally not seagoing folk. Just look to the disaster that was the Russo Japanese War for proof of that. Most of our maritime history is limited to fishing and running merchant routes throughout the Baltic and White Sea. Still, we recognize the necessity of at least a token naval presence. Though our traditional ice free ports are out of reach for now, the White Sea still remains open to us. We shall formally found the Eurasian naval na na National Navy to keep an eye on the frozen north, lest the Germans or Finns ever return. And if the Finns return, let's hope they return, actually. I want to beat up some more fins. Cool, let's grab that too. The best this artillery spend. Cut. Man. Debt just keeps going on up. Oh. We're still making two divisions at a time though, which is not bad, but still. A little bit of lag and that's okay. Cool. Alright, so how many divisions they got? Or 12,000 manpower. 67,000 manpower. Up to 19. Up to 37. That's not bad. That's not bad. Okay, let's come over here. Uh, Theodor. Let's go with Lud Lud Ludmilla. US Japanese talks begin. And we'll see what happens between those two. Aerial hegemony, nice. Frozen shores, very good. And their defensive fo fleet focus. Even once we all unite Eurasia, we will likely won't have much use for a large navy. We simply don't have the long, ice-free shores of our rivals, nor do we have any interest in oceanic power projection. The Eurasian National Navy should be designed from the ground up to focus on defending our shores from foreign incursion. Air defense, anti-sub warfare, and mine link should suffice for now. We get some more stuff for destroyers, for some cruisers. Not too bad. We won't really have too much of a use for this, but that's all right. And look at that manpower. That's pretty good. One, two, three, four, five, six. Oh my goodness, that's not enough. <laughs> Never enough. Get some more rubber. How are we doing with trade? We're doing okay. Are we lacking anything here, actually? Actually, no, we're not. We have loads of main battle tanks. Okay, so with this one, we have more than enough army XP. It's going to hurt us a little bit. Uh, armored stuff? No, let's do this one. APCs. APCs. I love APCs. Uh, it's not APCs. These are APCs. Those are APCs. We're going to make these guys 40 combat with... Screw these stupid little uh, IFBs. Which I think we use in modern day times. So. But still. At least in the game. Currently as they stand. Well, I prefer main battle tanks. I prefer thick armor boys. Cool. Uh, not bad. Not bad. Military police. Actually, I I don't mind military police because actually, if you look at the military police, they have 37 defense. If you need more defense on a division, throwing military police is not a bad idea, and gives you 12 more soft attack. Sure, it lowers your organization, gives you slightly you know more HP, but ultimately, like I kind of like military police. I should use it more often, especially for suppression. But still, already yeah, there you go. We'll leave it on there. Why not? Frozen shores, nice, and train one division at a time. It's fine with me. I don't really care. Cool. Defense fleet focus. Free dockyards? Uh, we'll just make some convoys, that's fine. Tons of planes. Tons and tons and tons and tons and tons of planes. There you go. One, two. Boom. And then go right there, too. Over here, what do you have? Cast? Yes, please. More cast. Alright, to subvert the Atlanticists. Some matter of naval conflict with the land systems of the Japanese is inevitable. As the world's naval hegemons, we, they will undoubtedly try to crush our Pacific ambitions at some point. The answer to their enormous surface fleets is obvious subs. Submarines are relatively cheap, easily crewed, and can do far more than just torpedo convoys these, or torpedo convoys these days. We'll need them for both offensive and defensive operations when the time does eventually come. One, two, three, four, five. One, two, three, four, five. What happened here? Ah! Cross heroes? Sure, why not? We can decrease the trading. Yeah, we could probably do that one. That's fine. Defensive fleet focus, and then we'll do this one. Yemen has defeated Yemen. Good job, Yemen. Good job beating yourself up. Cool. Now for the state's prosperity. The Eurasian commoner is an austere, hardy specimen. His ancestors were steppe warriors who lived off the land and dotly peasants who carved out a homeland for the forests of old Russia. He knows in his heart that he has no need for easy living or foreign luxuries. Our state shall return to the tradition and enforce this spot and lifestyle by law. Only the Eurasianist elite representatives of our glorious civilization have any need for wealth and comfortable living. After all, they need to display at all times the finest qualities of the ethnos, part of which is opulence and grandeur of the old Rus and nomad nobility. We can only get a ton of political power anyways, but this hurts us so badly. Minus 50% political power, minus 25% stability, minus 20% construction speed, which is why I'm saving this one for last. Less out factory output, less dockyard output, which doesn't mean too much. And but plus 65% more income, which is very good, just because we're spending so much money right now. It's insane. It's just insane. Whoa. How does this keep going up? Oh, because we made two more divisions, that's why. <laughs> but 8.3% is not bad. If we get it to 12%, that'd be pretty good. 
One, two, three, four, five, some. Hmm. That's why I'm just focused so much on building cities. Speer disappeared. Oh no, where is Speer? Papa Speer? Papa Speer, where'd you go? Oh, I don't want to do that one. It hurts so much. But the blueprint for Hegemony. Western Russia has proven a useful testing ground for a new economic order. All appears to be proceeding as their guide plan. The commoners are less of a drain, the rich are growing richer, and the military is keeping everyone in their place. Soon we shall extend the correct way of things to every corner of Eurasia. When our fellow ethnosists see the success of the masterocracy, they will no doubt rush to embrace it. Perhaps they might need some encouragement, but who's going to miss a few dissenting voices? Well, that's not bad. Cool. The Paradoxical Nation. All the late Lev Gumilyov's thoughts had turned increasingly towards the Atlanticists, and particularly towards the U.S. Try as he might, he simply cannot understand how they endured. Like Eurasia, it was an enormous country populated by many different social, political, and religious groups. The method by which they had arrived was, there, of course, very different, but the end result was the same, and also like Eurasia. They had been challenged within and without, and had been found wanting in both cases. <clears throat> But very much unlike Eurasia, they seemed able to, however, always resist internal disintegration for now. Always seemed able to, in the end, identify themselves and others as American no matter their background. Seemed always able to recover, return stronger than before, and internalize a grim determination to continue their fight. He contemplated this while looking at an enormous map of the confusing nation. It was truly maddening. Everything he wanted for Eurasia and his people, that strength of purpose, that unity in the face of repeated defeats, that defense against disintegration, the Americans already possessed. He had read numerous chronicles of American history in an effort to discover what special steps had been taken and found nothing. Gumilyov knew well that the revolution could, would, falter if such a spirit could not be encouraged. But he could not answer the question of how to do so. And so he found himself staring for hours at that map asking over and over how they had done it. He could find no answer. How do they do it? It's probably their cultural stuff, maybe. We'll see what happens. The Constitution, maybe? Eh. Only if people believe in the Constitution, I guess. But I'm more focused on the debt. This, this number... It just keeps going up. Oh my goodness. Because probably the debt keeps going up. And that means more debt interest. But hey. It is what it is. And it's all we can do. Wow, look at that. Um, Where's the black market trading? It is substantial right now. You get more attention and growth. That's not too bad, actually. But factory output does hurt. Well, we just hurt ourselves. And the blueprint for hegemony. Just shot ourselves in the foot, feels like. Spend, cut. Um, that, that did help out with a lot more money. But now we only get... Actually, we only get one more. That's not too bad. We were over two a day, so minus 50%, I guess it makes sense, we're 1.2. 16 billion, though, that is still god-awful. Oh, my goodness. But then we're going to reunify this part, and actually we might just go to war with the, um, Kazakhs first, just because we can. God, I can't wait for Tino 2 someday when you can just take out everyone in Asia. And there goes Egypt. Goodbye, Egypt. Have fun. Don't die too hard. Don't kill too many Egyptians. This coffee's pretty good that I have. Oh, boy. Is this the beginning of something much larger? Hey, no spoilers, no spoilers. Actually, for these guys, we could throw on... We should actually might have enough tanks. Yeah, we do have actually enough tanks to throw on our 40 combat with infantry. Look at that. Now they have 33 armor. Nice. Cool. And I guess we're down, so Russian reunification. Welcome to the state of Eurasia, my friends. That's a nice color. Oh, there's a very nice light blue. I love blue. That's my favorite color. Just Blue is just so amazing. But the drive into Siberia. Having conquered much of Western Siberia, we can begin making plans for how we plan to manage these new territories. There are dozens of pre-war plans already made we can draw from that deal with the large industrial complexes planned as part of the Siberian plan additionally. Several sites have been identified that could be suitable for resource extraction, which can be used to further advance our Siberian industry. There are even plots of land where it may be feasible to begin agricultural operations. Siberia is truly a land of opportunity, and we should endeavor to take advantage of as much of it as we can. All for all of Eurasia. All roads lead to Russia. Um, when someone, someone did leave in the comments from like the last video or the uh, video before that, um, for us to <clears throat> be as peaceful as we can to integrate people, and as much as I want to do that, I'll, we'll probably just go kill off Kazakhstan just to get them under us as fast as possible. So that's probably what we're going to end up doing, um, just because we can't get any more influence here or any influence and end of wonders. If you'd like to read about that, please go right ahead. Because I think that it has to be like w both of us here, us here, and whoever wins over here. But, I'd rather just get involved now. We have the PP for it, so our soldier will be good for it. We should do more than fine. Ah, uh, Larry enough did nothing wrong. Ah, into Siberia. Oh, let's go and close out of this then. And we'll read about this and close out of you. And the key to sovereignty. Um, 
well, I can't remember this, but nuclear weapons are the only guarantee of independence for global powers. The U.S. surely would have gone to war over Hawaii and some other Pacific territories years ago if it hadn't been for the lingering threat of nuclear war. The same might be said of Italy and Germany. Italy's pursuit of nuclear weapons is an effort to deter their monstrous neighbor on the northern border. So, too, must we develop this technology if we wish to ensure our independence. We share two of the largest land borders on Earth with a faction of Germany. If we ever a nation was under imminent threat, it would be us, but into Siberia. The rough-looking man braced himself as he watched the wind pick up over the snowy waste of the north. As the breeze passed him over, Igor decided that he would take one last puff of his cigarette before heading back into the mine. He and his men had been assured by the government's bureaucracy that a resource extraction operation on this site would yield great rewards in gold, yet they hadn't seen more than an ounce of it in three weeks of mining. This was meant to be his last venture with the company. All they needed to do was find a big enough vein to cover the company's costs and his debts, and he would be content to retire. He sighed, dropped a cigarette to the ground, and crushed it. At this rate, he'd have to wait another decade before he could retire. Not if I die in there, he thought darkly to himself. Mournfully, Igor grabbed his pick and started back into the cave when one of his men, a younger man in his 20s, slammed into Igor, nearly knocking both of them to the ground before Igor could even speak. The man clapped both his hands on him and said, Sir, we've done it. You have to come see. Eyes widened, Igor sprinted into the cave with his men, or the man, plunging back into the sprawling depths below. The desire of gold is not for gold, it is for the means of freedom and benefit. Absolutely. Family reunion. Oh! Oh, crap. Oh. Oh, wait, no, this is... Uzbekistan and Turkmenistan. Is it not about Kazakhstan? Family reunion. Ah! Uh, well, let's do the trans industry first. Conquest of any lands in the modern era is a difficult affair. Not only is it difficult to materially, militarily overcome someone, but it's also difficult to integrate once the lands are in your position. One's concern rarely considered when embarking on such adventures is how a land might be economically integrated into your nation. It requires rails to be ripped up and attached to your own network. It requires factories to be reorganized. It requires materials shipments from resource extraction operations to be rerouted. However, if you manage to do all that, your economic output will be maximized and your newly conquered peoples will feel much more like they're part of your nation, which is true. Tangri Slender. Also, uh, Angola did liberate themselves from the OFN, so. But now people have exploded. Whatever. Tangri Slender. Can you really do it? asked Gumalyov, his voice low but excited. The scientist nodded. Yes, I believe we can. We found sizable deposits of uranium beneath Omsk, and I believe myself was involved in the old Soviet nuclear program. Give me two months and I can have half my old colleagues here too, though they might take some convincing, especially the decadent Reds. Gumalyov waved his hand. Whatever it takes, this is our priority. Akimov, nuclear weapons are the key to sovereignty. If we cannot match the capabilities of other super ethnoses, the Eurasian project will never succeed. Whatever you need to make this work, ask me for it. Akimov nodded again, looking incredibly eager. Of course, sir. I shall. Trust me, sir. I believe in this pr as passionately as you do. For me, it was always about surpassing the West and making something better out of Russia. No need to validate your political credentials with me, chuckled Gumolyov. Off you go, Akimov. We'll call this mm, project Blue Sky. How about that? How does that sound to you? Perfect, sir, agreed Akimov. I'll best go find my old friends. I'll need a unit of soldiers or two, if you don't mind. Let's see them ignore us now. Ooh, I can... Ooh, yes. I like all that stuff. I like all this stuff. Agriculture, but that's redemption for red scientists. One cannot develop a nuclear weapons program without nuclear scientists. <clears throat> It may seem obvious, but it's true and sadly we face a severe shortage of said scientists. General education as a whole disintegrated after the Soviet Union collapsed, and even before then. The nuclear sciences was a rather niche field of study, however. That isn't to say it was non-existent. Records from before the collapse indicate that such a nuclear program, not too dissimilar to our own, had been underway as early as 42, before ceasing in 45 with the collapse. We have lists of names of several other scientists that worked on the program back then, as well as several other lists of candidates who were considered for the program. Additionally, we were able to find faculty lists from several former universities in Russia with the atomic research departments with the names of scientists we can use for our nuclear weapons program. <clears throat> Unfortunately, we have no idea where most of these scientists are today. After the invasion and subsequent collapse of the Soviet Union, many of them found themselves across Russia as they fled west. In order to find them, we'll have to embark on a nationwide manhunt. Every city, town, and village will be searched. Twice over, if we must. Those nuclear scientists must be found. Not bad, it's almost 1970, so let's go and just grab some more research speed. Cool. One, two, three, four, five, and a half. Not great, but it is what it is. <clears throat> Forbidden no longer. Tidings from Omsk. A few months back, we sent a team of geological surveyors to Omsk in order to assess the possibility of untapped underground resources that we could potentially use. In the reports, they determined that no significant veins of iron, chromium, or aluminum were to be found and recommended against setting up mines here for that purpose. They additionally mentioned that this recommendation was further supported by the detection of large veins of radioactive uranium in the area, which could make the extraction of other minerals more dangerous as we speak. A contingent of 100 men is setting up the preliminary base and mining operations will be underway by the end of the month. 
forbidden no longer. With two men in her hands, we've gained access to a vast array of old Soviet records from even before the war. Interestingly enough, we have seemed to have stumbled across various files pertaining to the old nuclear program that the Soviet Union had begun during the war, as well as some fragments of data on the tests and programs they made towards the development of a nuclear weapon almost 20 years ago. It isn't much, but it could aid us as we develop our own nuclear weapons. We should pass along this newly recovered data and information to the scientists and see what they make use of it. Very good. And we'll go to war within a week, so that's not too bad. And we're going to do that anyways. Let's go do that. Lower that too. That'd be good. Repurpose of bunkers. Omsk was the home of one of the most secretive organizations in Russian history, the Black League. Even after defeating the League, we still don't know what their intentions even were. Almost all information related to Karbyshev, and later Yazov's plans were destroyed during the siege of Omsk. The secretive attitude was even reflected in their architecture and city planning as well. At the city's core lies a labyrinth of bunkers and subway tunnels, which were, without a map, is nearly impossible to navigate. Where better to establish a top secret nuclear program? And, yeah, I know we shouldn't really go to war with these guys, but I just want to get them done and integrate it into our country as fast as possible. I think that'd be for the best, and Project Blue Sky. With all the pieces in place, it's time to formally begin our nuclear weapons program. We have the scientists, uranium, and a site worthy of any world-class research program. Its codename is to be Project Blue Sky, poetically named for the high god of Tengrism and Eurasia's and the skies. Soon our nuclear capabilities will rival that of any major power, and our presence and influence in Eurasia will overpower both Germany and Japan. Our nation will move closer to reclaiming its title as a major world power. Which is great. Keep spending. Spend, 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 spend. You can cut this down. These guys, they're not that strong. They have six divisions. That's not bad. But after that, let's go do Siberian plenty. The more we learn about Siberia, the more apparent its potential becomes. Every set previously identified for resource extraction ended up being a success, and dozens more have been identified since then. With such an abundance of resources and industry, it only follows that investments should be directed towards the further development of Siberia. Siberia will act as a bedrock of the new Eurasian economy, and if we are to ascend to the status of world power again, we will need to use Siberia for everything it's got. More resource efficiency gain and monthly population, sign us up, yes please. And since we have so much PP, you know, I actually like that. I really like that a lot, that, uh, that we currently, as a state of Eurasia, actually have a unique nuclear thing here, just because there's so many times, with so many of the warlords currently... Maybe this will change in the future. But currently, a lot of the warlords have the exact same readings. And so whenever I see something different and unique, I, I really enjoy it. So that's very cool. Siberian Plenty followed up with the Earth's Bounty. Western Siberia has been home to humans for a millennia and supported agriculture nearly as much of the time as well. The soil in these lands is uniquely rich and more importantly almost untouched. The relatively low population has meant that much of this bountiful land has gone unutilized and thus has remained the abundantly nutritious soil that was it was centuries ago or remain the soil that, was, that it was centuries ago. The bounties that farmers in the region collect are often far in excess of what they need to survive and are often exported out for the rest of Russia to enjoy. There's also probably another thing here. Let's see, look at cost. Military, ah, it's not that bad. Military spending is actually pretty low compared to everything else, so... We have 16,000 pieces of artillery to go. I guess we can make, make more guns, I guess? Um, battle tanks are actually looking really good as well. Get more fighters. I mean, this is one of kind of the rare campaigns where we're actually doing so well that we actually have more than enough equipment for the future. Now, we've got way too much debt and deficit, but oh well. <laughs> if you like to read about the best agriculture methods, please go right ahead because for this bread, we thank thee, and we have modern agriculture here in the state of Eurasia. Beautiful. Oh, yeah, stone and steel, why not? Our industry is always regrowing, sucking up more and more resources as factories prop up across the nation to provide an ever-expanding array of goods. It's up to us to ensure that the flow of resources continues into these factories. To that end, our new administration in the region has been tasked with scouting out potential resource extraction and quarry sites beyond the Urals that might be of interest. Around a dozen major sites have been marked thus far, and the local scouters assure us that more are on their way. We must invest into these sites and begin if we are to keep up our production and continue growing the economy. Military factories, that's okay. Reduce our national debt by $100 million. That means nothing to me. <laughs> the call to agriculture. Russia's greatest strength is, and always will be, its people. More accurately, its population. People are valuable for a variety of reasons. They pay taxes, fight in wars, and the more people you have, the more territory you can lock down with them. Our new territories are quite sparsely populated. Despite the ample space and farmland available that could be sustain a population up to 10 times its current size, the rural communities and farms in these areas remain small. We should begin a colonial drive to begin bring people out to these desperate lands as to make a life for themselves. Anyone who moves out of these territories will be given their own lands to farm on, free of charge. Not only will it allow us to bring more of our population safely behind the Urals, but also raise the productive capacities of our new territories and increase our food security. Always a good thing to do. I think that's a tank division. Yeah, it's only one, so yeah, it's a tank division. That's fine, just throw them in there too. Uh, let's go here. 
More Max Factories in the state? Yes, please. Thank you. <clears throat> and illustrious land, let's do family reunion. With our immediate situation secure, we can begin to focus on more diplomatically oriented missions. For example, our neighbors to the south and central Asia will make for important allies in the coming war with Germany. Even if they don't fight directly on the battlefield, they can act as a valuable buffer between us and German aligned Iran. Additionally, they could also be exceptionally useful when the time comes to liberate the Caucasus or Caucasus. Use of their air bases and ports on the Caspian Sea may prove decisive. We should let them know how eager we are to add to our list uh, of Eurasian allies. We want to add them to our list. We can do radar, but whatever. Uh, output. Get more. Actually, we don't need more output actually at all, but whatever. And we're only boosting up civilian spending just because it helps us build faster, 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 faster. So that's why we do it. That's why we do it. All roads lead to Russia. If you want to read about that, please go right ahead. But we're going to do all for all Eurasia. One that in Samada. That'd be kind of cool. But a family reunion sounds pretty good to us. We bled for it. Russia fought dozens of wars over 60 years in the early 19th century, painstakingly conquering and unifying the Caucasus under our rule. The conquest was slow and bloody and painful, but by the end of that 60-year campaign, we solidly controlled most of, almost all of the Caucasus. Most importantly, after the conquest, the Caucasus experienced an almost century of peace and prosperity under our rule. The Caucasus region are as much of our rightful territory as Moscow and will be treated as such an international diplomacy. Russia fought many wars to assert the Caucasus as an integral part of its territory. Those claims remain intact now. The area will be forever part of Russia or Eurasia. Not Russia, but Eurasia. The seeds of Eurasia. The Sokolov family, originally from Arkhangelsk, was given nothing by the WRF. Farmers by trade for hundreds of years through Tsar, through revolution, and through anarchy. The tillers of civilization were not helped at all by the socialists in the front. Fate would be benefit them, however, when two government officials visited their farm one afternoon. Good evening, Sokolov family. We are officials from the state, and we're here to inform you about the Eurasian Agricultural Initiative. Since local records indicate that your family are farmers as well as upstanding, we thought this, that this information would be very important to you. The eldest of the family, Yuri, would step forward and listen with a great yet careful intent. What's so special about this initiative? Yuri glanced back towards his family, afraid that any counterproductive action would result in retaliation. I'm glad you asked. One of the officials handed Yuri a pamphlet, one which extolled the virtues of the farmer towards the state of Eurasia. The state was willing to pay for new properties, subsidized towards equipment and seeds, as well as offering a stable buyer with a fair price. Everything they were denied under the WRF, they were being offered under the Passionary. Of course you would have to move, replied the officer, but if you are interested, visit the local administrative office and we will provide you or provide for our nation's finest. As the officers walked away, Yuri's eyes widened and his mind went wild as he browsed the pamphlet. While he cared little for politics, he would not mind pay playing them if it was for his success of his farm and the health of his family. Where communism wilted, Eurasian ideals will bloom. Nice. Very, very nice. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Seven and a half. Nice. Go, go, go. Seventeen billion. This keeps going up because we made another division, but whatever. United in history. We applied for it. The rally near the Kazakh border was the largest Gumilyov had yet held. Tens of thousands of local supporters, many of them Kazakhs and Tartars, had turned out in the normally quiet city. It swelled his heart with pride to see his ethnic brothers listening to his message out so readily. Perhaps there was hope for Eurasia after all. My friends and family began. People of Eurasia, welcome. Today is the most auspicious day in our shared history. This is the first time that true Eurasianism has come to the very doorstep of Central Asia. Not since Genghis Khan has our super ethnos been so close to total unification. He paused for a moment, the audience rapped. <clears throat> Which tack to take? I envisioned this years ago, our people so long disunited, finally recognizing that what binds us together. For too long have we fought over disputed borders, over faith, over petty rivalries. We alone of all the world's civilizations have never been able to set aside our differences and unite against those who profit from a continued division. The Atlanticists, the Romano-Germanics, the Asiatics, they've always feared and despised our state of bar barbarism, serving as fuel for the propaganda machines. They regard us as mere savages, incapable of greatness, of glory of matching their achievements. Well, I say no more. Let us stand shoulder to shoulder, my brothers. We are closer than ever to the birth of history's greatest empire. Let it become so, I say. Let the fires of passionarity rise and illuminate the path toward eternal triumph. The crowd roared, and the fires blaze ever hotter. So close now, and the forge fires burns. The fires of industry increasingly light up the skies of Russia. Every day that passes sees new factories built and fresh smoke arising from the smokestacks. In such house today, there lies a row of factories and workshops which have lain empty for months. No light escapes from them because no fires have been lit inside. They were closed during the conquest as our soldiers stormed the cities and declared martial law. Now, however, with the reintegration of Zlataus and other territories, as well as the resumption of civilian administration in these regions, it's time to begin putting these factories back to work. Radio Free Eurasia, this is a message for our brothers of the Caucasus. For far too long, you've languished under the tyranny of the Romano-Germanic scourge and their dark designs of extermination. 
Through your inherent fortitude, you have weathered the storm and survived the genocidal onslaught against all odds. Their scheme to replace you as masters of the steps has failed, and now it is time to go on the attack. Indeed, you can rest assured that the great civilization of Eurasia hears your plight and stands with you soon. Our vast army shall wash over the cruelly imposed borders of the Teutonic colony states and liberate our oppressed kins. When that time comes, the caucus will be... Be able to breathe an air untainted by Germanic filth for the first time in decades. Through the brave Georgians of the mountains and the defiant warrior peoples of Dagestan and Chechnya, rest assured that our hour of your liberation lies just over the horizon. Prepare for our arrival, for when the time comes, all of our ethnic brothers and sisters will be required in the uh, titanic struggle against the Romano Germanic state or scum. Together, we will set ablaze every last vestige of Teutonic influence to, that dares to blight our sacred motherland and with its corrupting influence. Woe betide any who stand in the way of Eurasian superethnos, reunited behind a singular furious purpose. Forward to liberation. Oh, we actually get claims on these guys? That's really cool. Oh, please, can I go to war with them? I want to. I want to go to war. That's so cool to actually get claims on them. Or maybe not these guys, but over here. Yeah. Please, please, no. No! Oh, we can't. Ah, <laughs> oh, that sucks. Actually, do we have... Oh, we probably need slightly more rubber. Oh, I don't want to give up what we have right now. But, lust your salvation. Oh, actually, book, book the go. But, gold and silver has been the backbone of almost every major world economy for decades. Gold and silver give a currency stability and also give a state easy liquefied assets. Our government happens to need such a new supply of gold and silver as their own supplies have been mostly exhausted as we've spread across Russia. Many of our former warlord states of the East had their own stockpiles of gold and silver scrolled away before we conquered them. Our troops have been scavenging former warlord capitals in the hopes of finding enough gold and silver to replenish our own supplies. Should we be successful, the gold and silver gain will go towards stabilizing our currency and laying the groundwork for the new Eurasian economy economy. And we'll do that one after you do it, break the yoke. The chains of slavery dominate or remain draped over the caucus, and they will remain there forevermore, should the Germans not be expelled from these lands. Inevitably, our armies will sweep through Muscovy and the caucus, freeing the region, however. Our job handling the German Wehrmacht will be made far easier for brothers and sisters to the south that are able to aid us in the fight. We must begin channeling arms and supplies to the anti-German groups in the caucuses in order to prepare for the coming war. We have a lot of manpower, look at that. Without cutting us down, we're actually at 900,000. My goodness. That's awesome. And it wasn't this one. It was this one. Break the yoke. That'll be good. And then we'll do Beyond the Black Legend. Many Russians view the people of the steppe, as they have for centuries, as evil barbarians plundering and raiding in all their paths. This black legend, as it were, is obviously false. The people of the steppe have settled into sedentary life, just as we have, and are no more barbarians today than the Mengjiang as the Mongol Empire. This legend is one of the many that divide us, no matter whether someone lives in the steppe, or in the Caucasus, or in Russia proper. We are all Eurasian, we should view each other accordingly. We must begin a domestic campaign to educate the people of this fact, and hopefully destroy the walls of ignorance separating us. Eurasian goal, though. Lev Gumilyov was many things, a visionary, a leader, a guy. He was not, however, an economist. But it did not need to be to understand the value and purpose of gold. The directive to search the stockpiles and hidden caches of their former enemies had borne fruit. Large quantities of precious metals had been found, including the ingot that had been placed on his desk stamped with the mark of a nation that no longer existed. He was informed that many, many more like it had been found alongside. A full inventory had been compiled. Tests had been confirmed their purity, and a calculation of value had been performed, and to transport to secure sites had been completed. The only question that remained was that what to do with all of it. And to Gumilov, Gumilyov, this question had barely worth being identified as such. It was a Eurasian medal, captured in Eurasia, and so would be applied towards the betterment of Eurasians as a whole. There were many things the country needed, things that needed to be purchased from abroad to do required hard currency, and was little more suitable than that which sat in front of him. Together, the resources of Eurasia, people, metal, and otherwise, would act in unison to strengthen their nation, improve the lives of those within it, and complete the worthy and essential objectives of the Passionarist Revolution. Any other outcome was unacceptable. The riches of Eurasia are vast indeed. Very cool. Three days left, two days. Not bad. I'll be honest, my goal is to actually split this campaign, this last episode, into two parts, but whatever. Look at that goal. But arms giveth arms given with purpose. It was just after midnight when the, with the Chechens secluded in a small cove on the edge of the Caspian Sea now saw the boat approaching. The journey to the coast, being some distance from the Chechnya itself, had been both long and dangerous. The Reichskommissariat's administration had spies everywhere, both German as well as their many local collaborators, and the men knew that to be caught was inevitably a death sentence. 
Still, however, they fought. For their homeland, for their people, and their religion. They fought with every tool and tactic available to them, no matter the consequences. And if all they went, the boat approaching them was to bring both new tools as well as the promises of more to follow. As the boat reached the shore, the men moved quickly to conceal it and moved its crated cargo with all haste to the shore while their leader met with a contact who had ferried the cargo across the water. Together, they shook hands and inspected the contents of the one of the crates. Automatic rifles, grenades, and blocks of high explosives, all effective for their purpose, but also relatively easy to conceal. The contact informed them that, if they could guarantee a receipt, he could promise another shipment next week, as well as every week thereafter. The Chechens quickly agreed the effort required would be enormous, but the reward were promised, an even more effective way to fight the hated Germans was impossible to ignore. Returned to the departing boat, the contact smiled as it returned across the sea. The Chechens were Eurasians such as he, suffering under extreme oppression, but in time with the assistance that he, that would provide, the Passioners Revolution would come to the caucus. The guide had promised it. All Eurasians will fight. They only need the tools with which to do so. Make the whole make whole what was sundered. The resources and opportunities of Siberia are vast and varied, but useless at the regions inaccessible. Rail lines that once connected those desperate lands to our own have been severed during the bombings or degraded due to years of neglect, and any normal roads that ever existed between our lands has long since deteriorated into nothing. Old rail lines will be renovated where applicable, and elsewhere new lines will begin to put down entirely. It may take us stitching together the nation with rail, but soon Russia will be whole again, and hopefully more than just Russia, but all of Eurasia. Our wild and mighty kin. The lands that once constituted the SSRs of Kazakhstan, Turkmenistan, and Uzbekistan now lies divided as the rest of Russia is today. However, even amongst the warlords of the steppe in Central Asia, there remains potential allies and like minded leaders. We should reach out to their leadership and begin engaging in diplomacy with these nations to the south. If nothing else, our message of peace and cooperation, even amongst the Eurasian nations, should endear them to our cause with time. They may even decide to aid us against Germany, but the legends end. Living. As he did on the borders of Kazakhstan, the farmer had, for many years, been prejudiced against those from Central Asia, and yet, as he had been asked, he could not truly have explained exactly why, which was why the pamphlet had, that he had been uh, that he had been handed in town earlier that day spoke to him so strongly. The animosity between Russia and Asia was foolish, it said, a product of the efforts of the many enemies of the Eurasian state. The past where they had once fought was long ago, and they themselves merely an artifact of the need to consolidate ethnic power in response to destructive European influences. Destructive influences that now came not only from Europe, but from further abroad as well. As such, the pamphlet had said that the peoples of Eurasia had moved past old animosities, old legends of behavior that had not existed for generations, and old resistances to integration. They had to move forward together, and seize their deserved destiny from those who wanted nothing more than to deny it to them. It took the farmer many hours to process what the pamphlet had said, prejudice long held, even absurd ones run deep and took time to overcome. When he locked up his house and began traveling to town once again in order to find more literature and he knew was he was not yet finished in doing so, but he similarly knew he would continue to work at it. He just needed more guidance, and more time besides. Prejudice fall as Eurasia rises. Great! And that actually hurts those guys down there. Nice. Good, we got that one done. Let's get some military construction speed too. And build us up more. Um, there's not a lot of places where we can build ourselves up. That's okay. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight and a half. Nice, nice, nice. Our wild and mighty kin. But complementar nost. The various ethnicities and cultures that encompass the former USSR were what we might call the complementar nost. The term is meant to just denote the innate compatibility and complementary nature of these ethnicities. Weakness that some of the races of the Soviet Union had were suitably balanced out by strengths other races had in a similar area. We should emphasize these cultural and ethnic differences, and how through cooperation these differences make us stronger, even as we keep each race separate in their respective territories. And Iraq has fallen apart. Cool. All for Eurasia, which will probably get another event soon. Oh, no, these guys get it. So, our endeavors towards the reunification of these Russian lands has not been an effort to reunite Russia or the Soviet Union or any other sort of Russian precursor state. The reunification of Russia is only a means to an end, with the end, of course, being the liberation of Eurasia. It would seem, however, that many do not understand this fact. Many see our efforts to reunify rather as an attempt to recreate the, Eurasian, the Russian Empire or some other such nonsense. They must realize that all we've done and all we plan to do is the interest of all of Eurasia, not just our piece of it. As well as, Passion and power once we get some more technology done. Extraction, yes please. Passion and power, tension. Oh, uh, we'll read this one. Town Square, 12.42 p.m. Today, in an unnamed town central square, a traveling lecture was being held. This lecture was to be a public one, one which would be free to all and sponsored by the government. The speakers, as they said, would be sharing with the audience a history of Eurasia and the virtues of the state. Come one, come all, Eurasia is for you and I. From the east to the west, makeshift movie theaters, pamphlets, and art shows, and more show the history of Eurasia. One shared not just by the rulers, but by all peoples. What started out as an intellectual movement started by the emigre movement, championed by princes and essayists evolved into geopolitical concepts which was later picked up by the guide of the Passionary Revolution. Lev Gumilyov, he, 
his studies and policies, and then the then leader of Us Sislovsk would form the foundation for the Eurasian state. The liberation of different ethnic peoples from the Tartar to the Komi will follow from the unification of the Western Russia from the various warlord states. All peoples of Russia were now free to shape their own destiny forward together under the Eurasian banner. Cultural ex exhibitions from different ethnic groups were also showcased, providing a convenient propaganda platform as well as a chance at multicultural reconciliation between various spectators. All in all, these exhibitions and lectures would positively spread the message of Eurasia for the masses, one which would form a valiant new history for our nation. Hand in hand, we're all Eurasia. But tensions are beginning to mount in a parody. T arguments breaking out between party members have become an almost daily occurrence, and the tone and volume of these confrontations have become increasingly aggressive and loud. However, at the very least, these are instances in which the two groups are communicating. Most worryingly of all has been the increasing isolation between the two groups, with many in each faction becoming progressively more radical and fanatic in their beliefs, of course. Our party, and the nation at large, is headed towards a crossroads. The pr path we choose better be chosen by them, or by then, or we can expect a dire consequences one, one night in Samara. The Kubashev Industrial Institute was a buzz. While no longer serving a purpose as a university for tonight, it was instead the site of a grand celebration to honor Gumilyov and the Passionary, one where representatives from the party, constituent ethnostates, military staff, and high society types toast to the success of Eurasia and the flourishing of united culture in, Eura in Russia. Shouts of Gumilyov will save Russia, and the guide of a revolution will ensure that the Eurasian golden age filled his heart with joy. These were people who years ago would have never even considered the idea of a singular strong united state able to liberate Russia from strife. Today, everyone was standing together under the Eurasian banner and under the guidance of Gumilyov. A smile skipped his usually serious, stern face. There were his people. This was Eurasia. As he took to the podium, a round of cheering broke through the halls and then a respectful silence to carefully listen. Ladies and gentlemen of Eurasia, I stand here today for all of you. No longer will we live with memories of the West Russian War. No longer will we stand separated by our grand ambitions and goals today. Everyone here has done their part to ensure that the success of our state, and that in itself, has done more for me as well as the people of Eurasia more than you could ever realize. Together, all peoples of Eurasia, under one banner, will fight the Germans. Freedom at last for those guys? Good job. 16 billion? That's not gone up or gone down at all, basically. Even though it looks like we do have one more infantry division there. We have 35 divisions in total. Or maybe that's actually just a tank division. But no matter what, we will go ahead and kill off whoever's over here, hopefully, quickly. And we have a total of 201 civilian factories. And the cracks show. Oh boy, Gumilyov sat deep in thought before his hearth. This was fine firewood, he thought, dense and heavy, well-seasoned, and radiating heat that pushed the frigid, frigid cold of midnight from his living room. Taking a drag on his cigarette, he sw idly swirled the vodka in his glass, staring into the flames. The flames of Eurasia's passionarity uh, were blazing with a fury unsurpassed in the history of the superethnos, but they were more concerns than just conquest. Without proper guidance, the flames would burn out of control and become a wildfire, consuming the very nation he had worked so hard to establish. He had reigned power. He had to retain power if he was to guide Eurasia along the correct path and restrain its self-destructive urges, but the Russians. Gumilyov scowled. The Russians, or rather the Russian nationalists, didn't understand that. It was a funny idea of Eurasia they had. Russia, but with a different name and different excuses for oppressing its brother's ethnoses. He had already been forced to make too many concessions to them, and their influence was steadily growing. He hadn't done all this just to see the Eurasian project succumb to the same chauvinism that fostered hatred between the ethnoses. Downing the vodka and flicking his cigarette into the fire, Gumilyov stood and headed over to his bookshelf to find something to calm his nerves. Maybe the secret history. Secret history. Genghis Khan's life was a great inspiration after all. Someday he would see the legendary ruler's vision fulfilled, hopefully with a little less budget. Russia's time is ended, they must accept that. And, since we're done with the focus tree for now, I will see you in just a little bit when we can go to war with the neighbors to our east. And here we are, everyone. June 3rd, 1971. Iran has fallen into civil war, and we are quite literally ready to go ahead and sweep eastwards, in which we have a million manpower ready to die fighting for Russia, in which we can sweep eastwards pretty much right now. Because right now, these, both these guys are killing each other, and it looks like the Far Eastern Imperial Realm is doing quite well, but with no manpower for either side. That's not looking so good. They have 17 divisions. They have 22. So I got tired of waiting. But right now we are rapidly cutting down on our deficit. We were early at like 16 billion, something like that. But now we're a little over 10.7, almost basically 10.8 billion, as we are just building, 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 building. It's so awesome. I've already cut off 17,000 from these people. Of eight, 19,000. Not bad. They've. I mean, it, this this campaign wasn't too bad. Okay, maybe I shouldn't say it was too bad. It began off very difficult. I'll be honest. Like this campaign started off very, very difficult. Just because Komi is not in a great position, and they don't have a lot of manpower. But right now, um, as you can see, we got more than enough manpower. We're actually demobilizing a little bit, but, you know, whatever. We lost aircraft plan. Oh, boy. Oh, well. Who cares? Let's keep going. I can put even more planes over here as well, so. Uh, but, like, yeah, you start off extremely difficult. But, like I've always said, if you can manage to get through the first stages of any warlord in Russia, if you plan out, if you plan things, 
and carefully and intelligently while well, they look really bad. Um, the the next stage would be easiest, and this last super regional stage is not too difficult either, so that's really not that bad. We've killed off 4,000, we've lost 377 so far. They have up to 21 divisions, and they should have still no manpower because they didn't have enough time to core everything. So, get some support weapons. Awesome, awesome, awesome. And we have so much PP too. I'm like, this is. I'm not sure what to do with it. We have nothing to do with our PP. We're actually building up a lot of roads now too. Nice, very nice. Uh, over here. That's only 20%. You can do that first. And then, oh, I can do that too. And we'll build up roads as we're going as well, I suppose. Eh, actually, it's not too bad. Not too bad. We don't have really good cast, but it is what it is. Just keep building up a lot of the roads so we can build things even faster. But currently, we have 13 billion. Oh, that's even worse. Oh, how'd it get worse? We must have taken a lot of military factories, though. That's probably what's up. Every main battle takes. I'm not even going to stop time now. Let's keep going, keep going, keep going. Kill them all off. Kill them all off. Main battle tanks, thank you very much. Another division. Awesome. And they're rolling on ahead. Oh, do you have upgrade? Gleb? No? Okay, then. Not bad, not bad. We lost how many? Building sabotage. That's not good. We did have... Oh, we lost 11,000. We cut off over 108,000 already. Not bad. And Iran is for all the, for falling further apart. Very cool. Head on over there, guys. Uh, let's see. I really don't want to use these guys yet. I still want to keep cutting this down. 13.6 billion. <clears throat> Civilian spending did go up because I did spend it. I actually cut down military spending as well. Just because we can at this point. So it's not too bad. 152 billion in terms of GDP is pretty darn nice though. And also we did get uh, better industrial expertise. So now we're innovative industry. We have modern agriculture and innovative industry here in the state of Eurasia. So I'm loving it. Loving it, loving it, loving it, loving it. Poverty is pretty darn close to getting to 15 to 25 percent as well which is awesome really really cool and that should push push us over the edge to do very very well in terms of money Ooh, we must have lost a hundred thousand or something wow that's a lot of losses whatever i think we're demobilizing anyways too so whatever uh, modern agriculture uh poverty rate of course factory complexes we didn't even get done with industrial equipment yet too because the top one is over there we're not even on modern industrial equipment yet and advanced uh, anti-tank stuff cool 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 oh Hey, actually, it is going to worth Syria. That's kind of cool. Don't always see that. Sometimes we do, but not always. And it is 71. Let's grab some better anti-tank or more air attack. Are we lacking anything? We're lacking, actually, a lot of main battle tanks right now. We got Everything else is really good, though. Holy crud. Everything else is very, very good. So, tankerinos. Oh, you need to? There you go. And, yeah, we're 40 for now. Not bad. We have plenty of plans to do that for now. That's fine. More main battle tanks. More, 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 more. Actually, let's get some of our cities back. Indonesia? Thank you, Indonesia. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Build up a lot more roads as well, which would be good. And roads up here, too. Oh, yeah. Build some up there immediately. That's fine. It's just really bad up here. But what else do you expect? 14 billion, huh? We've lost, what? 30,000 versus 200,000? They have seven divisions left, which is not bad. Ah, look at Spartans of Iran. Nice. We love Iran. Boost and cut. Actually, we probably need to boost any more. But whatever. Who cares? All right. And let's do some of that, too. The Levantine People's Republic. Okay, well, they're gone. The Syrian Republic. Nice. 35 divisions. Zayad al Harir. Ar Har Hariri. Hariri. Oh, that's kind of cool. Ah, scores. Uh, Mr. Baldman, the Italian version of Baldman. Uh, that is a very interesting way you want to go down and then back up towards own oh, land. Okay, then. It's very weird. Come to Kamchatka. That'd be very cool. Go, go, go. Support weapons. Even better. Nice. We've got 30% more land out of tech. That is extremely strong. Oh, there goes... Oh. Well, there go, those guys are gone. Oh, Cyprus has a little issue, too. Between Turks and Greeks. Ah, history. We've lost, what, 50,000 now? 38,000? Quarter million? Not bad. This keeps getting worse, isn't it? Oh, yeah, it keeps getting worse. Hey, decrease the poverty. If you want to about that, please go right ahead. A toast to our economists. Beautiful. Hey, that helped us up by 5 billion. Still not good. Still not good at all, but whatever. Ah, it just takes a while to get all the way over there. Three divisions left, not bad. They're like two-thirds of the way, or th they're, well, I guess maybe they're like three-fifths, but whatever. Nice. It's been a lot of fun, especially the later stages, because we want to create the state of Eurasia, which we will do. Like, I'll just use cons, commands, and annex pretty much everyone I think who should be part of Eurasia, which would be kind of nice, no matter who's at war with whoever. Who's this? Oh, Socialist Republic, that's right. So we'll take all these guys over. So we'll see what happens. Just because we can. Uh, where are the tanks? We have 20... Wait. We made more divisions. We have 43 divisions in total. What are you... 
You guys must be lacking tanks, that's what must be up. That's probably what's up. And they're only at 64% of the way there. Go, guys, go, 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 go. Y'all taking for Alva, where are you guys at? Guys, just go. Let's go. Magadan would be very nice to get. So let's go over there. There goes the Socialist Federation of Iran. Good bye. Good sir. We have 2,000 political power. That's so much pee pee. Wow. Now that's a lot of pee pee. Come on, let's air bases. Octobi. Uh, let's go do all this stuff first. That's fine. Get them roads done. Hey, Italy acquired nuclear tech. Good job, Italy. Just don't blow us up, please. And so the clock moves closer to midnight. 14.7. Oh, it's now 10.26. Not bad. Better armor is always good. Let's grab some even better gun stuff for those guys. And after that, it is almost 72. So we'll probably just go ahead and do some of uh, this. Yes. Nice. 10.26. 10.26. We're taking Cheetah. Keep going, guys. We ain't done yet. Quarter million. We've hit a quarter million for about 50, roughly 50,000. Not bad. 84% of the way there. Ooh. Advanced development stage. Yes, please. Yes. 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 Increase material procurement at whatever cost. Money doesn't matter to us too much. 178 billion in terms of GDP. Not bad. Hey, now it's 9.04. 07, I mean. I, can, I swear I can read numbers. Usually. Sometimes. Come on. Keep going. Keep going. Oh, do you actually have an upgrade? No. That kind of sucks, but it's all right. Hey, they we've killed off every single division. Nice. And they're currently 94% of the way there. We've lost 42,000, so. Overall, reclaiming Russia, not bad. Oh, my thumb. Oh, my fingers. Woo. And we've done it, my friends. Eurasia has won. Eurasia has won. And let's go and educate all these places, too, while we're at it. And we can re re reunify the motherland. A window into Eurasia, nearly 30 years after its defeat. At the hands of the Axis powers, Russia stands united once more. Or so the world initially thought. The new state that has arisen does not refer to itself as Russia, nor to its people as Russians. Instead, its leader Lev Gumilyov, the so-called leader of the Passionist Revolution, has identified the nation as Eurasia, with Russians only being part of the many ethnoses that comprise the state. Whatever its appellation, the new Eurasian state is reportedly rigidly organized and highly stratified, and also has demonstrated a propensity for extreme violence. Yay! It is uncertain how its neighbors, especially Germany and Japan, will handle such a rapidly belligerent power on their doorsteps. Another Scourge of God? Alright then, cool. Binding the continents, and which that is technically the end, but I'll be seeing you just in a little bit. And here we are, everyone, with the massive state of Eurasia. Now, I did basically use Consequence and Annexant Mall, but I did a few things here just to make sure that I didn't take Italian territory, which I technically, you know, this part of it. This is part of Asia, you know, the Levant, Jordan, Iraq, Syria, and stuff like that. But I'm like, eh, I don't want to mess with Italy stuff. And also, I took out the Caucasus and didn't really touch the Einheits back too much. But I would have liked to take this territory, but I don't really want to touch Germany right now, so... We did that, even though I did take over, I could come and caucus in, but whatever. Also took over all of Asia, just because we could. Except for Japan, I also didn't want to mess with J the Japanese, Italian, or German spheres of influence, so... That'd be like a major point of contention, but... I don't know, I thought it was a lot of fun. This campaign was a lot of fun. Maybe not so much in the beginning, but in the end, it was a lot of fun, and I liked learning about Eurasia. But now maybe I should spend more time learning about Gumilyov and his actual university, or a university named after him, somewhere in Russia, or somewhere in Asia. But regardless, if you enjoyed the campaign, leave a like, subscribe if you're new, check out my Discord link in the description below, and I'll see you tomorrow in another video. Thanks for watching, have a great rest of your day!